Duramax Highlights. And here's your host, Karin Helmstedt. Greetings once again from the German capital and welcome to our Highlights edition, shaping up this time with the following topics. Sharp Secrets, a Belgian photographer takes fascinating close-ups of the ocean's predators. Normal is the new wild. We explain what's behind the norm core fashion trend. And idyllic islands, why Malta is very much worth visiting. Well, it's a battle that marine conservationists have been fighting for years now. The fact that people are often happy to take on the cause of whales and dolphins, and yet sharks are perceived as those man-eating monsters. Well, Belgian photographer Jean-Marie Guillain is trying to change that. And after overcoming his own fear of sharks, he now hangs out with them on pretty much a daily basis. You seldom see sharks this close up. Images of elegant beauty, evoking no sense of danger at all. They are very sophisticated. They are a perfect uh, living creature with more senses than we do. And they, they can really perform in their environment like very few other, other species. Seeing the sharks give me happiness. So I really love the animals. Yeah, yeah. They are fascinating and they, some of them, they have nice personalities, they are sociable, so you can really build up a relation with some, some of them. Jean-Marie Guillon and his team seek contact with sharks regularly. The result is fascinating photos of encounters between humans and fish. The 59-year-old didn't even know how to swim until a few years ago. He had to overcome a traumatic experience first. My mother couldn't swim. And when I was a teenager, I almost drowned uh, in Italy. And, and I, I totally forgot that uh, it's only my sister many, many years later that uh, remind me what had happened. And I think that I've kept that fear of water that fear spread to encompass all parts of his life. For years, Guillaume was restless, moving from one job or relationship to the next. He couldn't find any inner peace until he learned how to dive. The only perception I have of sharks was uh, what the most people have, only fear. I didn't want to die idiot, if you see what I mean. So I wanted at least to confront myself to my fear and I realized that it was, there was no reason. And uh, at first dive, first time I was in front of a shark, I said, wow, it's so beautiful. And I was in love, that was it. It was love at first sight. Since then, Guillaume has been a marine conservationist. In 2009, he launched the project Shark Revolution, in which he works with scientists to enlighten people about sharks. And he uses photos to that end. He's just published a coffee table book of his pictures. I love the light. I like the way an object or a person, a face, is absorbing and reflecting the light. So, okay, it's a kind of an obsession, but I, I always have a camera with me, but I never thought I would become so-called photographer. But despite his affinity to sharks, Jean-Marie Guillon is always cautious. He's learned to interpret shark behavior very precisely. I love them, but I respect and I'm always careful. And if something changes in the water, I pull backward and, and I wait till things are settling down. And if I need, I leave the water. Don't provoke them, don't fool around with them. They are really much more powerful and better than, than you are in, in the water. Guillaume has never been seriously hurt while diving. And he says he's learned a lot from his underwater experiences. What does humanity need more than anything? Love. And it's true for many, many species. That's the way to create a better world, to have that ability to interact in, a, in an emotional way and leave the fear aside. For his latest project, Jean-Marie Guillaume is taking the plunge again, this time with whales and dolphins. He plans to release a film about the relationship between man and the sea at the end of 2015. 
beautiful just as beauty is in the eye of the beholder. What's dull to me might be exciting for someone else. Things like drain spotting or collecting traffic cones. And I picked those rather curious hobbies because they belong to a group of British guys that's made it onto the dull men's club calendar. Now this group is passionate about everyday mundane things and their motto is it's okay to be dull. Some people spend their Saturdays going for it. Others going nowhere. Living on the edge. Or looking at a hedge. The members of the Dull Men's Club don't give the matter a second thought. I think it's a nice thing to be dull. It, it, I mean, the, the slogan of the club is celebrating the ordinary. I think it's quite trendy to be dull, uh, and we're, we're starting a bit of a cult movement, if you like, by being dull. Twelve members of the Dull Men's Club and their odd hobbies have been immortalised in the club's own calendar. The 2015 edition features, among others, Hugh Barker, the hedge watcher, and Steve Wheeler, the milk bottle collector. He's got close to 20,000, even though he doesn't especially like milk. There's a post box spotter and a man with the world's biggest collection of traffic cones. Kevin Beresford of Birmingham is Mr. January. The Lord of the Rings, as he's called, is president of the UK Roundabout Appreciation Society. There's nothing more expressive than the one way gyratory. You can put anything on a roundabout, and I've seen fountains, statues, trains, boats, planes, pubs, churches, even working windmills. Uh, anything you like can go on a roundabout, and I think that's what makes them so special. Hugh Barker keeps abreast of hedges. Not the funds, but the shrubs. He's even written a book about them. Hedges are a surprisingly important part of our landscape. I'm partly interested in them for symbolic reasons, and partly because of all the strange ways that people cut their hedges into funny shapes, what, how you cut your hedge says about you and things like that. So it's, a, it's a, bit of, a bit of the silly stuff and a bit of quite serious stuff that underlies it as well. The book earned Hugh Barker the epithet London's dullest man in the British media, but he has no problem with that. A lot of the things that people are interested in might seem very strange, and but a lot of people have these quirky interests, and a lot of them are men, and I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I think it's something to be proud of, not to be ashamed of. The calendar was the brainchild of Leland Carlson, an American who founded the Dull Men's Club 30 years ago in New York, and later brought it to the UK. This is its first calendar, and it's already put the club in the spotlight. But the dull men often feel misunderstood. The news pick it up, they say the dullest men, we're not the dullest. I mean, that's kind of an extreme dull. We're just dull. Uh, we, we, some of us aren't trying to be the duller than anyone else. Celebrating the ordinary, just be content with ordinary simple things in life is a lot better than uh, going skydiving, for example. I, I think a lot of us would rather just take a nap. <laughs> the club estimates its worldwide membership at around 5,000. Newcomers are always welcome. The admission requirements are easy. The calendar includes a membership certificate. We were rather proud of this design, and it's a lovely two-tone gray with a touch of beige around the edge, two of her favorite colors. Many Britons dream of their little slice of ho-hum at least to judge by what London's calendar sellers have to say. We sell thousands of calendars a week and we're, um, that's easily our best seller at the moment. It taps into the eccentricity of individuals, but I think English people like that sort of humour and looking at that. But we're really pleased so far, alongside the other calendars we've got, and they're similar titles on previous years that have done well, and I think this year this will be easily our number one. Leaving the humour aside, the dull men just may have hit a nerve, or soothed a nerve in an often fast-paced, high-stress world. As psychologist Mark Coulson sees it, the dull men and their anything but exciting interests have a certain contemplative, almost therapeutic appeal. There are some research findings that suggest if you have a limited set of interests, if you limit what it is that concerns you, then this simple life is actually a happy life. That in today's society, we're just presented with too many choices, there are too many options. As a result, sometimes stepping outside of that frame and saying, well, what I'm going to be concerned about 
is what, what I find passion in. This may be a very direct route to happiness. Is this what happy men look like? The dull men don't go chasing after the latest fashion or thrill, but their unerring pursuit of their interests certainly brings a smile to other people's faces. In a way, we're, we're the avant-garde movement. Uh, we, we push out the envelope. People might think we're dull, but in a way, we're, we're the opposite. We're, we're, we're uh, groundbreakers, if, if, if you like. So look forward to an even less exciting but highly coveted calendar next year. Well, from Britain over to Berlin, and interestingly enough, many people here have been rather annoyed at what's been known as the hipster trend. Those ultra-cool anti-conformists that end up looking like they all came out of the same box. Well, the local response to this has been to dress what they call normcore, which involves striving to be so normal that it almost hurts. Whether in Berlin or Amsterdam, normal is the new hip. The word on the street is that fashion-conscious women and men are trying very hard to look like they're not trying hard at all. Wearing flip-flops, functional outerwear, and baseball caps. That's what's been dubbed norm core from head to toe. Sounds effortless? It's not. Not everyone who dresses normally is automatically in. David Rode and Jakob Haupt from Berlin write a successful fashion blog. They know what separates a true normcore wearer from an average person dressed in ordinary duds. For a long time, wearing socks with sandals was the ultimate fashion no-no. But at fashion's cutting edge, in normcore, it's in again. Why aren't most people normcore? Most folks aren't normcore because they're not doing it consciously, not making statements. It's just their usual look. Normcore is a combination of the words normal and hardcore. A New York-based trend forecasting group coined the term around a year ago. Now it's a major topic on Dandy Diary, the blog penned by David Roth and Jakob Haupt. Normcore celebrates conformity, eliminating the pressure of having to express your individuality through what you wear. The Normcore is a so with Normcore, what the masses do is okay. So it's all right to like Hollywood. It's an attitude that makes life much easier. It's always reported that now everyone is in, because the normal look is in, but that's not true. It's a hardcore version of the normal that's being shown. The trend is also seen as a reaction to the hipsters whose look is designed to draw attention to their supposed difference and coolness. Elements of normcore are now showing up on the catwalk. Models for Jill Sanders' spring-summer collection strutted their stuff in knee socks and sandals. Chanel transformed the catwalk into a supermarket, that most mundane of places. Normcore style icons include Apple founder Steve Jobs, US President Barack Obama, and Britain's Prince William. Normcore wearers sport labels popular with insiders. They may wear white socks, but only ones with the logo of a well-known brand. It's actually a critique of individualization that everyone's striving to be an individual. Now they're going in the opposite direction and saying, I'm not an individual, I'm just one of the crowd. That's how most people approach fashion, a few personal touches aside. This photo series from the coffee table book People of the 21st Century serves as proof. No matter what the look, it will always be picked up by the crowd. Dutchman Hans Eichelboom took all the photos. For two decades, he's been using a hidden camera to catch candid shots of the man on the street. I am not so interested in uh, fashion. I'm interested uh, in, uh, in, in people. And uh, uh, the, that process of, of, of finding the, the right clothes for yourself is, is always, and for already a very long time, the same problem. Hans Eichelboom took pictures on the streets of Paris, Amsterdam, New York, and Shanghai. Though the places were different, the results were the same. Often, it took him just a single day at any given location to create an entire photo series of similarly dressed people. The result is a two-decade-long study of style. 
the question for me was in what part are you a, a product of your culture or in what part you are a product of your own uh, development. The norm core trend exposes individuality in fashion as an illusion. I don't think it's due to fashion fatigue or a lack of desire to deal with fashion anymore. On the contrary, it's following the latest trend, and that's being normal. And being normal is really tough. Just try it. And that puts ordinary pastimes, like going out for a coffee or a stroll, in a whole new light. They're the ultimate non-spectacular normcore ways of spending a Sunday afternoon. Well, with the 25... 25th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall now behind us. It's worth noting that many parts of Germany have changed dramatically during that time, particularly Dresden, a beautiful Baroque city in the eastern state of Saxony, has benefited from German unification. Well, the city was literally flattened at the end of World War II, and here you can see the ruins of its most significant landmark, the Frauenkirche. But thanks to an incredible feat of public and private funding, the church has been restored to its former glory. Looking at the Frauenkirche today, it's hard to imagine what it looked like 20 years ago. Raised to the ground by Allied bombs in the Second World War, the East German government left the ruins in place as a reminder of the horrors of war. That legacy is still visible in the darker stone bricks from the original church. The first time I came here, it was after the fall of the Berlin Wall on an icy cold February morning in 1990. And when I came back in 2004, I saw the Frauenkirche re-erected, and there were tears in my eyes. We remember it from the old days, when they called it the Black Ruin. And now the Frauenkirche has been rebuilt, and we love it, especially as I was born in Dresden. First completed in 1743, the Frauenkirche, or Church of Our Lady, was restored according to the original plans of Baroque-era architect Georg Bär. Today it draws thousands of visitors every day. They come for the church services or concerts, or just to take a look inside. Restoring the church to its former majesty was no small undertaking. An unprecedented worldwide appeal for funds raised more than 110 million euros, covering over half the eventual costs for reconstruction. The local media talked of the miracle of Dresden. Among the major proponents was Ludwig Göttler, a world-famous virtuoso on the Baroque trumpet and conductor. Göttler headed a foundation and held classical concerts for the cause. His fundraising heroics earned him official honours from the German president and Britain's Queen Elizabeth. I'm grateful to be part of that sense of community. It wasn't so much about saying thank you for getting something. It was more about people feeling it was a gift, just being able to be involved. In 1748, Bernardo Bellotto, called Canaletto, painted his legendary view across the River Elbe, in an era when Dresden was dubbed the Florence of the North. The church was part of the famous skyline. Until that fateful night of February 13, 1945. After collapsing during the firestorm caused by Allied carpet bombing, the church was history, it seemed. But four years after post-Cold War German reunification in 1994, the foundation stone for its revival was laid. The reconstruction incorporated more than 8,400 sandstone bricks salvaged from the ruins. Donations received from across the world helped ensure the church was completed on schedule. Some 60,000 people gathered in June 2004 to witness the finishing touch, the installation of the cupola and gold cross. It was re-consecrated on October 30th, 2005. For Eberhard Burger and his team, it was a triumph over conditions and critics. Ich erlebe das heute noch, dass mir Dresden oder auch andere I still get locals or visitors today saying that originally they were against it. Auch dagegen, aber but after seeing the Frauenkirche and everything else that's emerged around it, 
They appreciate its importance for the city and its people. Then they have to say it was the right thing to do. The iconic landmark has been restored to its former glory and height of 67 meters. It's visible on the horizon from kilometers around. A viewing platform gives visitors stunning panoramic views of a city reborn from the ashes. And because we're in the throes of a dark northern European November, we'll finish with a trip to the much sunnier island republic of Malta, which is actually made up of three main islands named Malta, Gozo and Comino. A former British colony, Malta is also a member of the EU since the year 2004, so let's see why about a million tourists flock there every year. Craggy cliffs. Crystal clear water. Deserted landscapes dotted with tiny villages. That's Malta, a popular holiday destination. Pilot Joseph Galea knows the islands like the back of his hand. He takes visitors out for scenic flights every day. I was always looking forward to become a pilot since I was a young kid and it was my dream job basically, so I'm there now. Today's tour starts out in the capital Valletta. It's a city steeped in history. Different cultures have left their mark on Malta. The Arabs, Italians and the French and, of course, the British. Nasi Kalamata is a local who grew up with British traditions. When we were children, then to come here on Saturday morning, see the changing of the guards and see the soldiers um, from Scottish and Irish regiments with the bagpipes. In 1947, the Malta archipelago achieved self-rule. It became an independent state in 1964. The Maltese language contains Arabic, Italian, French and English influences. What gives us our identity is our language. So we understand each other so well in this like secret code. And what brings us back here every time. The local cuisine also has many different roots. Chef Michael Kauke, who has cooked for the Maltese president, runs a restaurant on the palatial premises in downtown Valletta. In his kitchen, olive oil is the chef's most indispensable ingredient. Basically, the oil plays the biggest part of the meal. I mean, if it's a very good olive oil, you can feel that every, everything goes into, into each other. The best place to find quality olive oil is on the adjacent island of Gozo, a 15-minute flight away from Malta. Wild olive trees have been growing here for decades, but it's only in the last 10 years that they've been actively cultivated by a small company called Gozo Cottage. Malta and Gozo have a truly maritime climate. The olives are practically immersed in salt as the ocean's all around. And the thick, loamy soil adds a special character to the olive oil's taste. Nearby is Gigantia, a megalithic temple complex. The open-air temples here are among the world's oldest. Legend has it that they were built by giants in a single night. The ruins are even more stunning when seen from the air. As our pilot Joseph Galea banks around, we fly over the azure window, a natural arch formed by the collapse of two caves. They are unique because they are natural. Um, and especially the outer window, let's say, it's a big, very big place and most of the nicest place for divers. Diving is one of the most popular sports on Malta. The government has permitted diving schools to sink old ships here in order to create artificial reefs. The overgrown wrecks attract plenty of recreational divers and fish. On land, in the air, or underwater, there's plenty to discover on the island of Malta.
And that's all for this edition of our Euromax highlights. So until we meet again, take good care and all the best from Berlin. Ciao and bye-bye.